in terms of like mental health, I've struggled because I find it's obviously I do what I do and I love what I do, but sometimes it's hard not to compare yourself to other people. Yeah. Known for her viral Halloween transformations, now renamed Sophie Halloween, alongside her f- trend focused festival looks, it's no surprise that Sophie is bringing out her first book, No Rules Beauty Bible, with HarperCollins, which later comes out this month. Sophie has also worked with some of the biggest beauty brands in the industry, including Charlotte Tilbury, GHD, and Rare Beauty. Sophie also owns a successful hair dye brand named Sophie Hannah Hair, which has killed it on TikTok shop and sold out. So welcome to the studio, Sophie. Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Um, honestly, like every time I've met you, I'm like, oh, I need to set up my makeup no, today. No, stop it. <laughs> Bless you. Normally I'm like, oh, can I do the podcast makeup free? And I was like, no, because Sophie's coming on today. So ah. I actually have to put, make a bit of effort. I brush my hair especially for you. Amazing. Your lashes <laughs> look insane as well. Oh, thank you. I actually don't know which ones they're from, but um, I switched to a new brand recently because I've learned a lot about like me. Oh yeah. How like I'm not a fan of. Okay, fine. Um, are they individual or false? These are false. Oh my God, you've stuck them on so well. What do you Literally, think? Yeah, they look seamless. Oh, that, I'm going to take that because yeah, no, they look really good. bad. <laughs> I remember the first time I ever used false lashes was at prom. Oh yeah. And it took me 40 minutes to stick one on. Oh God. I no. was 16 and very clueless. Oh, bless you. Um, they are hard to stick on though. They are. I remember one being like coming up towards my eyebrow, oh. which was a great look. But you know, it's when we look back at our old photos of ourselves and we're like, Terrible, terrible decision. Yeah, always. I'd rather have that before than now. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, obviously, like I've spoken a little bit about how you literally kill the beauty industry online. I love watching your transformation videos mainly because I'm like, I would never be able to do that myself. How did you get into doing beauty online? So, oh god, uh, rewind to like ten years ago. So I actually, when I left university, I, well, I studied fashion with photography at uni. And then when I left, I actually wanted to be a freelance fashion stylist. So I kind of moved to London and I interned with like Elle magazine and um, a fashion stylist and just kind of tried to, you know, make my way, make contacts. I did that for about a year, then realized that it's who you know, it's not like what you know or how good you are at it. And I wasn't really getting any money. So then I had to get a job and I actually got a job in social media. That's when I kind of discovered blogging and I set up a blog to basically showcase my own style in the hope that someone would book me to style them for a shoot. Yeah. So that's kind of like the thought process behind it. Set up Instagram, started um, sharing my outfits of the day, every day. And then people started saying, oh my God, like your hair, how did you do that? Or how did you do your eye makeup? So then I started introducing video tutorials and then it kind of just grew from there. And I had a couple of other jobs in social media. I worked in a PR agency. So essentially I was kind of like working um, brand side. I was running fashion and beauty, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, like all of their social accounts and then doing mine at home alongside. And then I hit 100K on Instagram and I was like, I feel like I could potentially take this full time now. So then that was nearly seven years ago when I quit my job. Wow. Like when you said 10 years ago, you must be like the OG of influencing. You know, I wouldn't even say, I'd say maybe like one of the OGs, but not the OGs. I feel like the OG to me is like Zoella. Yeah, 100%. Sorry. I forget. Yeah, one of the OGs to me is like Zoella on YouTube. But I guess it's probably helped you out a lot working brand side because then you know what brands are looking for as well. Exactly. And then I think working brand side, I was able to kind of know how much influencers were charging at that time to know that when I hit 100K, actually I could earn a decent amount. You know, I could I could actually make this into a job. Um, and also, yeah, like knowing how to deal with contracts and how it kind of works like between a brand and an influencer, kind of that side, yeah. Yeah, it's really weird. Like when you, um, when I've spoken to people that are probably like on 100K now and stuff and they don't necessarily get paid. And it's like, no, you should be telling these brands you want uh, to be paid for They are that. getting paid. And exactly. they are getting paid so much more than I was when I was on 100K years ago. It's crazy. Yeah, I think I think it's because there is so many people in the industry and on the market now. Yeah. Um, how has the industry evolved for you over the last like 10 years? 
Uh, it's definitely changed a lot. I'd say, I mean, in so many different ways, like even just taking the algorithm on social media channels, like back in the day, I'd post three still photos on Instagram a day, every day, and they would do well. And it no. literally didn't ha even have to be anything crazy. Like I'd post like one outfit, but I'd do the, a full length shot, a mid shot, and then a close up of like my nails with my belt or something or my yeah. handbag. And like every single one did so well. Fast forward to today, it's like you're spending, you'll be spending up to 10 hours filming one video, hours editing. It has to be, you know, really slick content, really thought through. Like it's completely changed, like the whole industry. Um, it's a lot more saturated now. There's so many people, especially since lockdown. Um, I think a lot of people discovered creating content in lockdown because there was nothing else to do. And so now there's, God, I like triple the amount of content creators. Um, also, I think back in the day, I, get a lot of inspo from magazines. Like I'd buy magazines. I don't buy magazines anymore. Anything, yeah. Everything's digital now. So even just that kind of thing in the industry has completely changed. Maybe I'm the only person that still buys magazines these days. Do you? Yeah, I do. I still buy my L like every... Oh, yeah, that's so nice. The only time I ever bought magazines like recently was if it for my house, like homeware magazines, like for inspo oh, and stuff. It's quite yeah, nice to look at. Yeah, they're really cool. But it's um really weird when you say like every time you'd post three pictures a day and it would all do well. Yeah. Because now you'd be like, that would never happen. No, Unless never. you were like a Kardashian. Yeah, literally. I mean, on TikTok, you can post more than once a day, but the guarantee of it, of every single video doing, going like, like viral or doing well uh, the percentage is quite low, I think. Well, for my channel anyway, the other people obviously might do quite well. But yeah, Instagram for sure. You need to post once a day because I feel like if you post twice, your engagement kind of spreads across both of those posts yeah. rather than just all going to one. I miss the OG Instagram algorithm where you would see everything chronologically. Yeah, and also I knew exactly what times to upload. I'd be like, right, I'm posting at 8 a.m. in the morning because everyone's on the way to work. Yeah. I'm posting at lunchtime at like one o'clock and I'm posting 6.30 p.m. on the way home. People will see it. So like I knew, and I think everyone else knew when to post when the most engaging time was. Whereas now, you don't know if someone's going to see your post after five minutes in four days. Like, yeah, because I'm seeing stuff come off my timeline now that was four days ago. And I'm right. like, oh, I've, I've missed that. Like, that's old. So crazy, yeah. But how, so now that the, like, industry's become more saturated, have you found that it's impacted your your workload or your work life? So I definitely think in terms of, like, mental health, I've struggled because I find it's, obviously, I do what I do and I love what I do, but sometimes it's hard not to compare yourself to other people. Yeah, of course. Like, because, I mean, I don't sit there and watch my own videos. I sit there and watch everyone else's videos. So I take in what other people are doing. And I'm like, oh, should I be doing this? Should I be talking more? Should I be? And I think, no, like I need to just focus on what I'm doing and just enjoy what I'm, because I enjoy, I love what I do. So I just concentrate on that. Um, but yeah, it's very, it's very saturated now. And I think it's hard in terms of working with brands because there's more of you. So sometimes the brands like to go and try different influencers to see how their content would do, or maybe there's another influencer more suited to their brand than you are anymore. Um, however, I do feel like I'm, I, I do feel like I still dominate what I do. Yeah. There's not many people out there that do beauty, hair and fashion. I feel yeah. like a lot of people niche down um, and just do one thing. So I do feel like that kind of sets me aside from a lot of people and also just having colored hair. And that's always set me aside. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm probably one of the biggest hair dye influences in the UK. So I feel like that kind of, I dominate that, which is great. So yeah, I feel like I've still got really good things about my page, even in a saturated market. Yeah, I think when I think of like influencers that do makeup and things, it's more like day to day or neutral. Whereas when I think of like colorful, I do think of you. Yeah. And like colorful hair and stuff like that. So I guess that is probably easy for you in that sense. To, and it's also easy to stand out on social media when oh, you look and you're like, oh my God, that's really bright. Yeah. Because I always stop and look at your context. I'm like, oh, she's painting herself green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, but you are also self managed. Yeah. And. I also think that's something that's really unheard of in this industry. Like people have managers to help them reach out to brands and help them manage their workload and you do it all yourself. Yeah. Which I think is wild. 
what was the reasoning behind the decision to be completely self-managed? So I, so when I quit my job, I actually worked at a PR agency and when I left, they launched a talent management. So I naturally knew who was managing me. I knew them very well because I've worked alongside them. I went with them and I stayed with them for about four years, I think. And it was great like to kickstart in the industry and to kind of have someone manage that side of things. It worked really well. But, um, after about four years, I'd obviously grown my Instagram um, and my YouTube. And I was like, you know, I feel like I just want to take it to the next level. And I feel like, well, with all management, they're managing a lot of talent. And so yeah. if jobs come in, they might give it to somebody else. Like I know how it worked behind the scenes. And I think I just wanted more. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to take it in-house. I also felt like I was lacking relationships with brands and contacts because I never saw my emails. So I didn't know who the the PR was behind each different makeup brand. Um, yeah, and also I never saw any contracts or anything because it was all done for me. So I kind of just wanted to gain a bit of control and yeah, have a bit more of an insight into actually what was going on with my business in, in a way. So yeah, and it's been amazing. Like I signed up to Diary Directory um, which you pay a yearly fee and you get access to every single contact in the beauty and fashion industry. So it's amazing, obviously, if you want to manage yourself. Um, and then and then I think they do influencer rates um, to make it cheaper because I think it's quite expensive if I like, imagine. a company like look, like look pays a subscription. Um, so I got that to help me get started. And then, yeah, I've been building contacts with brands um, ever since and just building those relationships because I never had those before. Like I left... It's so funny. I left management being, I had, I think I, like over a million followers on Instagram and I didn't have any contacts in the industry. <laughs> that is wild. Yeah. Like, I didn't have any contacts. It's weird because you would never think that about any other uh, like business or industry no. out there. Like if you had reached that level, yeah. you would be able to know everything that's going yeah, on. Exactly. And I didn't. So whereas now, you know, I, I work very closely with lots of different makeup brands and I have relationships with loads of them. Um, you know, and I might go and meet them for dinner or lunch or go to events. And it's just so much nicer now um, because, and also it's great in terms of doing campaigns and jobs. Like if I'm filming something and I think, oh, I've just had a thought during filming that do I need to do something? And I can just WhatsApp or email the brand and I know I'm going to get an instant reply. Whereas when it's with management, it's like you have to then email your manager, but then they might be busy or in a meeting or away. And so to then it's like a train of people. So it just gets stuff done quicker and um yeah so I think it is tough managing yourself because obviously you know you get inundated with emails something I do lack is um outreaching but I'm quite lucky that I have enough work coming in that I don't need to do that yeah and I've recently hired a publicist um to help me with my book launch so hopefully like she kind of picks up any thing if there's any brands that I want to work with she's there to fall back on. So it's nice to have someone else. Um, but managing myself, yeah, is something that I'm still doing now and it's going great. What well, was it scary when you first like broke away from management? Uh it was, but I think I was just so ready to just have more control. Um yeah, I think I think through doing this, like I've learned that I am a bit of a control freak and in just more like I just like to know what's going on because I feel like if I'm doing a job or something and I'm clueless or I have no idea who this the PR is behind the brand or it it just throws me off. I feel like I just want to know the ins and outs of everything. And also as well, in terms of just actually my schedule, I'd like in this industry, a lot of the jobs are very last minute. So when they come in, they're like, right got this job for you we need it posted next week and I can literally look at my schedule and be like right that's not going to work so can I post on this day or let me move this around to accommodate you whereas when I have management that sort of thing was never really spoken about it was like this is a job this is how much it is and you have to post on this day and it was quite hard trying to say well actually can we negotiate it, they just never really did that for me whereas now I feel like I can better there's probably less pressure for you to accept work you don't want to do either. Exactly. Oh my God, that was another thing as well. Like their jobs would come in and I'd be like, oh, I just don't know if that's right. And like, oh, were they going to pay you more money? Oh, I'm still not quite sure. Like, okay, well, I've got you an extra 500 quid. And you're like, 
I feel like I can't say no. And I am a people pleaser through and through. I've learned that through therapy. <laughs> so I would just please my agency and do the jobs. Whereas now if something comes in and I'm like, actually, I don't want to do that. Or I don't like the look of that product. I will just say no. Or if they say, uh, we've only, like I say my rates and they say, oh, you know, we don't have that budget. I'll say, well, sorry, that's my rates. Because yeah. I always think like, I always think like this when I uh, renovated my house, I hired tradesmen and I said, you know, I want my kitchen done. And they were like, okay, well, it's going to cost you this much. I didn't then go to them and say, oh, I can't afford that. Can I actually knock you down a couple of grand or, because that's not how it works. Like they've rate, like given me a rate for their service. Yeah. So I always stay true to that. Like that's my rate. And that is that rate because of the quality of my content, the engagement, the amount of hours that goes into the work. Obviously the fact that I've been doing this for so long, all of them, like my camera equipment and stuff, like the editing software all adds up. So I'm like, my rates are, I know my rates are good for me. So yeah, I, I stick to them. And also I find it, I don't like giving a lesser rate to one brand and then making another brand pay my rate because I feel yeah. like it should be equal for everyone. And I do feel like in this industry, people talk as well. Oh my God. Yeah, They'll get around. They, yeah, hundred percent. But I think it's, it's nice because obviously you were talking earlier about sometimes when you are, uh, you struggle with your mental health in terms of comparison, when you look at other content creators, but I guess in that sense, it's probably reinstated your, like the, how much you value yourself and the work you do by saying that this is my price and sticking to it. Cause I do feel like in this industry, sometimes you're like, mm, too scared to ask or like, am I worth this much? But actually, yes, you are. Yeah. Because 100%. of the skills and like the knowledge you provide, like you said, with all yeah. of the, the things behind you. Yeah. hundred percent. I think you just got to believe in yourself and I mean, I've been in this industry for a long time and like you say, people do talk. So I do roughly kind of know what people are charging. I charge a lot less than some people, but for me, I'm like, that's a good rate. And also like, you know, I'm happy with that rate. Like I can live off, I can pay my mortgage or pay all my bills and stuff. Like it works for me. Um, it's it's weird because off camera I was saying like oh I used to be one of those people that be really guilty in saying that I didn't think it was like a proper job or a full time job and then you told me some of your looks would take eleven yeah, hours eleven hours yeah Vecna was eleven hours <laughs> yeah so honestly like I love doing cosplay like obviously Sophie Hannah Ween has become a thing now and I think it's funny because when I look back at my old Halloween makeup looks. They never took me that long. I never spent time doing them. And to be honest, like to me, I look at them and I'm like, they're terrible. But obviously I had to start somewhere and it's yeah. nice seeing the growth when I look back. But obviously when lockdown came, I had so much more time on my hands. So I just experimented with makeup. I spent, and I was like, said to myself, it doesn't matter how long I'm sat here for, I've got time. I don't need to be anywhere. So yeah. if it takes me 10 hours to do this makeup, five hours, to do this makeup, I'm just going to sit here and do it because I enjoy doing it. And then I actually realized that if I spent a little bit more time and more like actually like put more quality into my work and my looks actually did pay off. So then I, that Halloween, that first Halloween of lockdown, just people were like, Oh my God, this is crazy. Like your skills and your Halloween makeup just grown into, and then even last year, just seeing my looks and how much I'd improved from the year before. It's hard though. Cause it puts pressure on me. Cause every year now I'm like, Sophie halloween has got to be bigger and better than the year before. Um, but I love doing it. So yeah, even though it takes so long, it's enjoyable for me, but yeah, people don't see how long it takes and they just see like a 30 second clip. Do you think the, the desire or need to be bigger and better than your last content uh, yeah. <laughs> has an impact on your mental health? It does. Um, and also it just, it's just very stressful and overwhelming because obviously you, it, it just puts pressure on you. And then I start planning Halloween in August. So I start planning in August. Wow. Yeah, start planning my looks, start ordering everything because all of my looks, like I might need contact lenses or special effects makeup. So the closer you get to October, it all just sells out. So I try and be really on it with planning everything. Um, even that's just stressful. Like I'd have to say last year doing Halloween and um, having my hair brand and launching a book was very <laughs> stressful. I just took on so much. I think I shot all of my book content so I shot around like 200 photos in my book and I edited all of them as well um, uh, two weeks before Halloween whilst doing wow. when Halloween looks. And people look, obviously didn't realise because I couldn't share any of it. And I kept sharing online that I was really stressed and like struggling with my mental health. 
And then I was like, I need a ho- after Halloween, I was like, I need a holiday. And I went on holiday and I did not shoot any content when I was away. It's the first time in 10 years I've ever done that. Went on holiday and didn't do any content. And everyone was like, good on you. And I was like, yeah, but if you actually knew what I went through, you'd be like, why did you not take that holiday sooner? But yeah. It's also really weird to hear someone who's an influencer not shoot any content on holiday. I know, right? Because a holiday is not a holiday. A holiday is time to get content. That's another thing. I think like being an outsider, a lot of people think, oh, well, influencers get to travel and they go to these amazing places. And I'm not going to like, yes, they are incredible experiences. They are amazing. Like I've been given the opportunity to travel to so many different countries and see so many different cultures. But at the same time, for me, it's work. Yeah. And so whenever I go on a brand trip, it's always, I'm professional. I won't really drink that much because I want to be professional. Like it, it's work at the end of the day. I want to please the brand. I want to make sure I'm filming content for them. The itineraries are jam packed. So you're creating content for them. Because essentially the reason why a brand's taking you away is because they're, they're paying for you to go away in return you're going to create content for free essentially yeah Uh, but they're essentially paying for it for you because they've paid for you to go away um but yeah holidays I would book a trip for myself but it would always be like right what am I going to shoot on this trip then I'm going to do this this and this and he's planning all my holiday outfits I'm gonna do a styling video this time I was like I'm just gonna put it like pack a suitcase of random stuff in my wardrobe that I don't even care I'm not going to try on any outfits before I go I'm not gonna plan anything and I'm just gonna go and it was actually really nice the control freak in me is like "Ah!" And yeah, oh, packing honestly, clothes yeah. without trying them on. I know, right? That's, <laughs> that's usually me all over. But it was actually amazing. I felt really weird. Like my husband said, like I felt really odd the first like couple of days because I was like, I don't know, I felt on edge. I was like, I couldn't relax because it wasn't normal to me to do that. And then I was like, what am I doing? Like I'm on holiday. I'm not, I don't need to film any content. Like I don't need to worry. And then I was like, right, I'm relaxing now. Do you find your husband's not uh, an influencer, is he? No, but he works with me. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say, like, sometimes they don't get it. Oh, no. So he, uh, how does that impact your relationship? No, he's actually really good. Like, he, I, I mean, I think sometimes we both sit there and we're like, hang on a minute. You're doing this or you, you're going to this place or you've just got sent this for free? Like, this is wild. Like, we even, like, still now, you know, 10 years down the line, still pinch ourselves at, like, what's going on, like, in the industry or at home or whatever. But he's really good. Like, he helps me, edits my videos. Sounds really silly, but like he'll just help me around the house. Like it's a very 24 seven job and so, so many parcels and the recycling is crazy. It's, honestly, it's crazy. It like yeah. my, <laughs> you should see, I ha- have this lovely little, <laughs> what I thought in my head was going to be this lovely little courtyard in my house, like in my garden. And I was like, I'm going ha- to have this, I'm going to have all these plants. It's just a dumping ground because of the amount of recycling. And I don't even know what's turning up. Half the time I don't even like, obviously I'm very grateful for all of the PR gifting, but sometimes I'm like, I wish brands would ask before they send the product because yeah. sometimes it's stuff like I'm allergic to quite a bit of makeup now. So it's like, if I get sent a liquid eyeliner or something, like I can't use it. So obviously like I'll gift it to my friends and family, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but yeah, it, sometimes it, it can be very overwhelming when you receive a lot of packaging, but I don't know how pe- people have my address. It's crazy. I don't know where they get that it That does from. scare me a little bit. Yeah, it bit. scares me. I, th- I reckon PRs must send it round. Yeah, actually, that's probably they're a good all quite, point. Like all friendly, but yeah, I I do really appreciate also sustainability as well. Like as an influencer, I'd rather PRs email me, and a lot of them do now, and say we've got this gifting. Would you like to be gifted? And sometimes I'm like, look, I've been sent so much recently. I don't want to take it because it's just going to sit there. And I'm not going to have time to use it. So make up as a use by date. Exactly. Which people don't realize. Yeah. I did not realize. Yeah. And, but also, like, I don't want it to sit there and go to waste. Like, give it to another influencer that will actually use it. Or I, I having a hair brand, no, it costs the brand to send yeah. samples. So I don't want them to waste their money if I'm not going to use it. So I'm very picky now with gifting and with work. Like, I really think about like what I'm using and yeah. No, I think that's really cool. Obviously, you mentioned your hair brand. Yes. Um, how did that come about? So that was a that came about in lockdown. Um, it was basically a bit like Dragon's Den. So I had this company that I kind of pitched my idea to essentially, and they loved it. And then they helped me with everything. Like helped me with like manufacturing, production, distribution. Basically took took everything off of my hands, created me my brand and my product, all like up to kind of the standards that I wanted and I expected, and created me this hair dye brand. All I had to do was kind of 
market it essentially. So they are known for creating brands for creators. Um, and it was great because I had a brand which a lot of people will <laughs> have trolled me for <laughs> in the past. But I had another brand years ago called Sophie Hannah Beauty where I sold glitter and face jewels. And it was great, but I did it all myself. So yeah. I did all of the design of the products, getting them manufactured, shipping it out, the website, everything. And I did it on top of getting married and renovating a house. And it was just too much. And in the end, I was like, something's got to give and it's got to be that because... Yeah, I couldn't do everything. And even now, like I remember when I launched my hair brand, someone was like, oh, I wonder if it'll be a failure, like a beauty brand. And I was like, no, like they don't, people don't know obviously behind the scenes, but I couldn't, I'm a one woman like business. I couldn't do everything. And so anyways, that's why when I, I always wanted to launch a brand again and I wanted it to be hair. Like I love hair dye, I love hair color. That's what I'm most known for. I love experiment, experimenting with my hair. And I thought the next time I launch a brand, it's going to be done right. And so I believed in this company and I was like, it's going to be done right with this company. <laughs> so I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that where's the hurdle coming yeah, into this? Yeah, oh my God, honestly, I've literally, last year I think I cried. And again, behind the scenes, no one knew about this. I think I cried every day last year for like the whole of summer because of just the stress of this brand and how just... It was just, yeah, it was just a lot. Obviously, I'd love to go into to details about everything, but I can't. Um, but yeah, basically from, I didn't realize, but from day one, like the finances of the brand were overlooked. Okay. So the profit margins just weren't there. So yeah. essentially my brand was making a loss without me realizing. Oh, okay. And I only realized because uh, the company were d delayed in sending me like reports and spreadsheets. So I didn't realize until a couple of months in, and obviously by that point, it's too late. I've already put a product out. The RRP is there. Can't increase the price. I like the product. Without getting people trolled. Have, yeah. And people have tried the product and they loved it. So then I couldn't reformulate. I've just launched a brand. So it was a bit of a disaster really. Um, but I I did launch into Superdrug. I have to share that. I launched into Superdrug to just kind of, well, that it was amazing having them really interested and they wanted to retail my product, which was incredible. Um, but recently I sold out in Superdrug and I haven't chosen to restock with them um, just because I then left the third party company and I've taken Sophie Hannah Hair in-house. So now I'm doing it all myself. Yeah, I was thinking, which... I was like, you clearly obviously don't pick the easy stuff to do. do no. You? And also it's annoying because I started out my hair brand wanting to do it properly. And now it's just come back and landed in my lap again, exactly like Sophie Hannah Beauty did years ago. So it's a lot. However, I am taking it on board and, you know, I'm lucky because my product is already there and it's already done. So that part of it, I don't really need to kind of focus too much on because I've got, and also I've already got so many other colors and formulas ready to, to go. It's just okay. a case of being able to afford to restock. Um, obviously I've made quite a loss with my brand, but I'm not giving up. It's not stopping me. So now I am just investing more money and I've started TikTok shop in January, which went absolutely wild. And I sold out of the leftover stock that I had, um, in three weeks, which is crazy. Wow. Yeah. Um, but now I'm having, like when you have your own beauty brand, there's lots of different regulations and things you have to buy by in the UK, especially when you import beauty products. All of this I did not know before. Now I know having like doing it all. So I'm just trying to sort out all of that at the moment until I can restock again. But it's just typical that happened at the same time as I went out of stock. Yeah, I was going to ask you what your, what was the biggest lesson that you learned from essentially the failure yeah. of Sophie Hannah Beauty? Um, wait, Sophie Hannah Beauty or Sophie Hannah Hair? Wow, either. Either, yeah. Uh, do you know what? I think in this industry, I've learned the hard way through 10 years that like business is business and people just want to make money. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think, think that's what ultimate, that, that's literally the lesson I learned. I think as well with beauty brands, you always have to keep up and come in with the, like, what's the next beauty brand? What's trending at the moment? And sometimes like colorful hair is trending, sometimes it's not. And yeah. then you're having to like switch between the two. But Every time I've seen a beauty brand, I always think, oh, someone's just launched a product and it goes, it's successful straight away. Yeah. 
but then it's not until I actually sit down and speak to people and they've had like, well, technically I've had like three failed businesses before. So yeah. before you get the right one. 100%. And it's funny because I'd say even when I had the brand with the third party company, so I launched in December, 2021 and I left them December, 2022. So it's very recent. In that whole year, I you know, the, the, there wasn't much help with marketing and social media. So I essentially was just making up as I went along. Like obviously- the way that I did social media for brands 10 years ago is completely different to how it works now. Yeah. And I'm not in that space. So I'm not as educated now. Um, I hired a, a social media manager for Sophie and Hair and she's literally incredible. She's Gen Z. She's insane at content creating. Like I'm, And I love that I've got her to help me. So she's literally at the moment that's <laughs> doing Sophie and Hair is me, my husband and my social media girl. And um, we're now having, like my husband's now um, shipping out the product for the brand, taking it all in-house. I've got a storage unit, keeping all the stock. Like we're starting from essentially, starting from scratch again, but as a small, tiny business, how they all start. Yeah. I think maybe it was, maybe I shouldn't have gone too big straight away. I think, and especially with the third party, I think, they saw my following. They saw how many views my hair dye videos get. I think we all just thought it was going to fly off the shelves and sell out, but I'm not Kylie Jenner. Obviously that happens with Kylie Jenner or KSI or all these other creators that, you know, like prime drinks. Oh my God, they fly oh, off the yeah. shelves. It's crazy, but I'm not them. And I think they were putting me in that bracket. Okay. So when I wasn't getting those, like I didn't sell out on day one, they were really disappointed. And that made me upset because yeah. then I'm like, I'm failed from day one. I hadn't at all. Brands take years to grow. Like you say, pe people have to have three, four failed businesses. It's not going to, it doesn't matter if you're a content creator, like you could launch a product and it might not sell. But I believe in my hair dye brand. I believe in my product. It's sustainable, vegan, cruelty free. I have been using it for like the last like three years. Like I love my range and I was so close at giving it up, but I was like, what a waste though, because it's a good product. I just need people to try it. And now because of TikTok shop, which I'm so grateful for that opportunity to even be on that platform and the fact they set that up, so many people have tried it. And now the demand of people wanting it is insane. I'm gonna get messages and emails every day. I'm like, what the hell? Like, this is crazy. It's like I had a complete like 360 turnaround. Um, I think the hardest thing in business is getting people to try your product. Yeah. In that, when they, when it's so saturated. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's like you were saying when you just went, tried to start too big basically yeah, and that, keep yeah. up with brands that have already been established for years yeah. beforehand. Do you find that actually having a really supportive partner has helped you? Oh, a hundred percent. Like literally bless him. He, so he used to work at Sky Sports um, and he was really happy with that being his career. And he, you know, we assumed he was going to grow in that. Um, but then obviously I kind of grew on social media and it was very overwhelming and trying to do everything by yourself is really difficult. Yeah. Um, also, I want a life as well. Like, I want to make sure I'm prioritizing my mental health. I'm taking time out um, because I, I need to do that for myself. I need to have like a work life balance, um, which I've learned the hard way from just having a work life. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but yeah, he's amazing. So he ended up leaving his job just before lockdown and then coming in house with me and helping me. And it's amazing, like, just having someone else there to support me. Like, brainstorm ideas like when it comes to Halloween I'm like right you brainstorm I'm gonna brainstorm we'll come together we actually love like we do our walk our dogs every day and that's our time to like chat and we'll just chat brainstorm we'll talk about like business stuff or life things or whatever um because yeah I think it is hard when you live together and work together it becomes very we only really talk about work yeah, so and it's nice. in each other's pockets. Yeah, which we, it, it, it doesn't phase us at all. Like we get on really well, but I think it's nice to have dogs to walk because that gives us that time to actually connect out the house. Because yeah. house to me is associated with work. That's the thing with being a content yeah, creator. Yeah, when you work from home, it's hard. I think one, it's weird. Did anyone ever criticize the way that you your marriage really works? Because it's, more common than not that a woman would give up her career to support her male partner, but not necessarily the other way around. I know. Um, 
you know, my husband's amazing. He's honestly like the most chilled person you'll ever meet. And I always check in with him because I always say to him, look, if you're not enjoying this anymore, or if you think, you know, suddenly want to have your own career doing something, then I don't want to stop you. So please like, just tell me and go ahead. And I always check in because I don't want him to sacrifice his life to, to work for work. Why well, I say for me, work with me. Cause I always yeah. think like we're a team. Um, but I think a lot of his friends probably think it's crazy because they're just like, well, that's so mad that you just work for your wife. Um, but a lot of people actually will say like, oh God, I couldn't do that. I couldn't work and live together. But actually like we're best friends and it works for us. Like it won't, won't work for every couple, that kind of work life dynamic, but it just, yeah, it just works. It's, um, obviously we've spoken briefly about your book. Yes. And that is the new thing to the Sophie Hanna empire. Yes. <laughs> so how did this come about? So the publisher is Harper Collins and they contacted me. That I think it was shortly before I launched my hair brand actually. So just November, December, 2021, they contacted me and just said, they've got this kind of concept for a book and they thought that I'd be perfect for writing it. So the concept was like a Bible. Um, and it housed beauty, hair, like fashion. And they were like, we just think that you'd be perfect for it. Obviously, I have, I've never, ever thought to myself that I would ever write a book. It's not something that's been on my list um, to achieve in my career. Um, I was never really, a, like, I was never really that great at writing at school. Um, yeah, and I wouldn't say my vocabulary is that great either. Essex girl. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, but when they contacted me, I was like, oh, I can't give up this opportunity. Like what an incredible opportunity. And also I really wanted the challenge because I was like, oh, like, I wonder if I could actually do this. So I said, yes, had a few meetings and then just I, what the hardest thing was starting it. I think yeah. we kind of, the first thing I had to do was kind of put a, put a bit of a contents page together. So I just listed kind of topics within like beauty, hair and style of like what I would talk about. And then they had to, so even though they'd asked me to write a book, hadn't actually been approved. So they then had to take me like, like, like Sophie Hannah Brand and my contents page and the concept to like the top people at HarperCollins, like pitch it, I had to pitch it. And then it was all signed off. So that was like the first hurdle. And then basically was, uh, was allowed to write it, but starting to write it was the hardest thing. So I was like, I, d I didn't know how to, to start writing a book. I'd never done it before. Um, but I actually kind of treated it as like, because obviously my book's very different to other books. It's very, you, le it's, you learn a lot. It's a lot of information. There's a lot of um, pictures, tutorials. So I kind of treated it as like mini blog posts in a yeah. way. So I'd have one little section, which could, which might be um, how to apply false lashes or something. And I'm like, right, I'm just going to focus on that one topic and not think about the rest of the book. So I'm just going to write that one section. And once that's done, I can then move on to another one, how to apply eyeliner. I'm going to, so kind of like it's like mini sections. And I started doing that really. I started with makeup first, I actually kept it in order of the book weirdly. So I just literally did it in the order of the book. Um, and it took me quite a few months to write it. I literally, Again, this is another reason why I stopped weekly vlogging because my life was just sat by a computer and it's not interesting at all. <laughs> and I couldn't share about it either. Yeah. But I spent like 13 hour days writing. For a whole year? Uh, not a whole year, no. So it was like kind of in section. I'd say it was probably about four or five months writing. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but obviously not every day. No, that's so, still a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. I'd say it was towards the end when my deadline was coming. I was like... I need to up the ante here. And I wanted to obviously proofread it all and make sure it was okay. Um, and I didn't want to not miss a deadline because that freaks me out. So I spent, yeah, 13 hours every day. I found this weird Spotify playlist that was called like music for writing. And I had, I put these like noise cancellation headphones on and just sat and just 13 hours a day, every day for three weeks towards the end. I'm gonna have to find this playlist because it sounds great. It's it's really weird. It's basically sounds like you're in an old house and it's like kind of like classically kind of music, like someone's playing like the violin, but then it sounds like people are walking upstairs and then like floorboards are creaking. It sounds really weird, but it worked. It sounds like something out of a horror film. It, it kind of <laughs> does, but actually it's really good and it really just zoned me out and I was able to just concentrate on 
yeah, typing away. What was your favorite part about your book? Oh God. Um, I think the favorite part of the book is actually seeing it in its physical form because I sat for a whole, like, well, probably like eight months just seeing PDF documents of it and seeing it just on a Word document, like no color, just black and white text. Mm. Um, so I think that was probably the best bit was receiving the actual physical book and opening it up and seeing it all come to life. What was the worst? Bit? Like, what was the worst bit about writing about it? About writing it? Yeah. Um, starting it. That, I think that was the worst bit. I think trying to start it because it was just very overwhelming. And also I had a word count of 45,000 words minimum. So even just knowing that was yeah. really overwhelming. And I was like, I, I, I kept going to my computer and being like, I can't do this today. <laughs> I can't yeah. do this today. I had to like, re and then when I, but once I started, I got in the flow. It was just actually initially starting it. It was just very overwhelming. And it's funny because I thought 45,000 words, never going to be able to write that. I ended up writing 60,000. 60, Wow. Yeah. So I actually went way over. So, but it's weird when I got into it, I was like, oh, I need to mention this now. I've just spoken about this. Oh, I feel like I need to develop it and talk about this. So just kind of expanded the more I wrote it. Do you think you'll ever write another one? <laughs> I know it's not oh, come out yet. Oh and I'm God. already asking if you'd write another uh, book. Do you know what? I, th I think it might be a one and done. <laughs> 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 Only because like a lot has got, I didn't realize how much work goes into writing a book, like hands down to people that bring out numerous books. Like it's a lot, like just from planning it to writing it, I shot all of the content as well. Like there's some stock imagery in the book just to kind of, I didn't want the whole book to be my face. So some stock imagery in there, but a lot of like the, all the eyes is my eye. Like I've shot all of that and I edited everything. I've looked at the, like briefly through all the pictures as well. That is, it's, when you said you shot everything yourself, I was like, wow, you would never like think yeah. that was all self shot. Yeah, all self shot. Um, yeah, and like even that, I overestimate. I, I was like, right, I probably a week to shoot all the content. And I started shooting and I was like, okay, no, I'm definitely gonna need, I'm gonna need two weeks. And I have to say like my eyes and my face were sore by the end of it. Cause I was like doing a look, rubbing it off, doing another one, rubbing it off. Cause I had oh. to cram it. Cause obviously I did this amongst being an influencer. I couldn't not, like obviously that's the thing when people write books, they still have a job and life that they need to up. Cause it's very under wraps when you have a book. Yes, deal. it is. Um, and some people get a lot longer to write than others. Obviously with mine, they'd, said that they wanted it to come out now so it was always that I was going to have like basically a year to really plan sort of thing. I mean the contract didn't actually get signed I think until the April so really I had April until December to kind of get it all done and obviously then you need to get it done in time for the editor to read over it um and for them to put all the imagery into the design of the book obviously that's like another concept that has to happen so yeah there's actually so much that goes into the book to, into a book. I know we said briefly about um, how starting something is really, really tough because you don't know where to start. And the market in general, especially being an influencer or being a beauty creator is very saturated. What would you say to anyone that's listening that wants to start doing something in this industry? I would say definitely just sit down and kind of have a think about what you want to actually put out there. Like what are your passions? Um, what do you enjoy doing? Is it I don't know, is it interiors? Is it beauty? Is it gaming? Like really think about what you love doing and then just, just like make content. If you scroll back and look at what content I made when I first started out, it's completely different to what I do now. And you can see that there's growth. So you're not gonna be amazing straight away. You're not gonna have the best quality content, but it doesn't matter. I think just start and you will eventually learn from your mistakes, learn different tips and tricks as you go along. Maybe you might watch some YouTube videos about how to film or how to get started. Yeah, I think the, I think the hardest thing is starting, but just find what you're passionate about because um, you want to enjoy the content that you create. Yeah, I think comparison's a killer as well, right? Like oh God, it's such a killer when you compare yourself. And the thing is though, I think if you're creating something that you don't like, your audience is going to know. Yeah. Like you can just tell. So I think just yeah stay true to you and who you are and do what yeah do what you love what do you think what's next in your Sophie Hannah empire so obviously you've got your hair and now you've got the book yeah. uh I think that's probably it for now to be honest um I don't actually have any other plans I think my biggest one at the moment is obviously like book launch I want to get it out I want people to read it 
Um, and then just getting Sophie Hannah hair to a place where actually, like, well, I've salvaged the brand, really. I need to kind of salvage the brand now and work on that and just grow it from the ground up now, really. Do you feel like you've ticked everything off, like, your big wish list? Like, every person in the industry has, like, a big um, thing they want to achieve. I think I've ticked off a lot, most of my wish list. I have other things that um, I'd love to do. Like, I'd love to potentially get into TV. Um, I mean, I said to my publicist, if Strictly Come Dancing ever asked me, <laughs> come on in. <laughs> like that, that would be amazing. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there's other things that would be such core cool opportunities, but I think everything that I've kind of ever really wanted, I've managed to achieve, which is incredible. So I think right now, I mean, I'm one of those people that always wants more. And it's yeah. like, I'm really trying to kind of be grateful for everything that I've got now and then if anything new comes amazing so I'm very content with pretty much yeah how how like everything I've got and I mean last year was very stressful um with everything that was going on so I feel like this year I kind of just need to enjoy enjoy it a little bit more do you know what I really could see you doing being on the panel of like drag race oh my god that would be amazing like with all the colorful makeup I'd love to and like, hair. Uh, be on glow up as well I could see you on Glow Up as well, actually. Yeah. I think I that'd be really cool. so many comments from people being like, you need to be a contestant on there. But I feel like I don't need to utilise that show to be a contestant. And also yeah. I wouldn't want to take it away from people that actually want to utilise it to build or grow their platform. But being like a judge on there or something could be kind of cool. I love, we're just using this as like a manifestation platform. Manifesting. Anyone is listening, <laughs> yeah. please put me on Literally, Glow Up. Hello. <laughs> um, I always ask um, all of the guests that come on my podcast very similar last question. Okay. Um, and it's what would you say to people in your past or people potentially in your future that doubt your success based on the fact that you are an influencer? Oh, um, I'd probably say past. I feel like a lot of people probably just thought, what the hell is Sophie doing posting outfits online? And I'd say, <laughs> literally, literally. Yeah. so like I'm glad I well and also I am such a hard worker that I've worked my ass off over the years to be able to do what I do and yeah it's funny a lot of people probably didn't believe in me and that I could do it I actually I'd love to tell this story I had um some friends like a few years ago like I don't know if you ever saw the video I did like a nose hair uh, video. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I saw that. <laughs> it, it still comes back to haunt me now. It was like a train where you put like false lashes up your nose. Anyway, it went viral and I actually had some old friends I saw trolled me on Facebook. Oh, yeah. For, for that video being like, I can't remember what they said, but they just like wrote some really horrible stuff about me. And I was like, I mean, to me, I'm like, that's obviously a trigger. Like you're clearly just seeing how much I've grown now and you're just saying it to just... And like get back at me. Yeah, I don't know whether they knew that I'd saw those posts, but I saw them, and I was just like, oh, like, just annoying. But I'm kind of glad I'm not friends with them anymore. If that's how they think of me. A lot of people probably don't realize that you do read everything. Oh my god, yeah. Oh, I read every single one of my comments on Instagram, and so, uh, and I like and I comment back. Like, I actually appreciate my community. Yeah, it frustrates me. Some influencers they don't communicate with their audience. They never like their comments or that they never reply whereas I literally try and reply to everyone DMs is a lot harder because sometimes I just get in, inundated but I always try my best to comment back on everything TikTok Instagram um yeah because obviously I wouldn't be here without people loving what I do and enjoying my content obviously most of it you know part of it is me producing the content but the other side of it is if people weren't engaging then I wouldn't be where I am now so yeah. obviously so grateful to my audience and um yeah, one was why I've written my book for them, really, to kind of have something substantial that they can learn from and use to express themselves. And yeah. I guess your book is also um, proof that if you listened to what other people thought about you, you would never, it would never be here in the first place. Oh, it, it, literally, exactly. And it, it kind of, I talk about that in my book in terms of linking to your makeup and hair and everything. Like just be who you want to be, dress who you want to be. Don't worry about people judging you or it's, it is hard. Like mentally on, you know, when you're having a down day, you see a troll comment, it does sometimes get to you. But I think if you just keep being 
you and staying true to yourself, like you will get to where you want to get to. No, I think that's a really amazing message to like end the episode on. So I'm really grateful that you've come on and you've spoken to us about your new book. And I actually can't wait to read it because um, I'm going to need to use those bright colored eyeshadow yes. palettes that are just chilling in the I'm back of my drawer collecting yes. dust. Yes, I'm so. going to do it. <laughs> thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. It's, so. I find it really ego inflating, but I also I'm one of those people that doesn't like having my ego inflated. Yeah. I get really self, maybe it's just it's something I need to work on clearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's something, it's clearly just a me problem.